You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Hey, thanks for tuning to this episode of the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Today we're joined with Rod Cleef, real estate investor, entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and podcast host to discuss what he sees in store for the 2024 real estate market. We touch on multifamily, office, retail, single family, the economy, and much more. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. We're joined with Rod Cleef today, and we're going to be talking about multifamily, what's in store in 2024, opportunities, challenges, all of that good stuff. We're going to hit all of that. But before we dive right in, Rod, I know you've been on the show before, but we always have new listeners tuning in who might be even new to the game of real estate. So would you be able to give maybe a, a little bit of information about yourself and kind of how you got involved in the real estate space? Sure, sure. I'll try to be as brief as I can. So I'm a Dutch immigrant, immigrated when I was six years old with my brother, Alma, my mother's Vancha, ended up in Denver, Colorado, uh, lived in Denver for 30 years. And we didn't have much growing up. In fact, uh, I wore hand-me-down clothes from the Goodwill. We ate expired food because it was cheaper than regular food. We drank powdered milk with our cereal in the morning. And, you know, we really struggled. And my mom had an incredible work ethic. So she babysat kids so we'd have enough money to eat. And she's the one that got me into real estate. So she bought the house across the street from us when I was about 14 for about 30 grand. And then when I was 17, about to graduate, she told me she made $20,000 in her sleep. And I'm like, what? And this was when 20 grand was a lot of money. I'm like, you made 20 grand, you didn't do anything? Screw college, I'm getting into real estate. So I went and got my real estate broker's license. I was actually a broker. I could have my own office. Right when I turned 18, you could do it back then with education. Now they got smart. You need some experience. But I was a broker and I was smart enough to go work for another broker. But my first year in real estate, I made about eight grand. My second year, maybe 10 grand. But my third year, I made over $100,000, which back in 1980 was really decent money. And so what happened between year two and year three is what I talked about the last time I was on your show. What happened was I met a guy that taught me about mindset and psychology, how 80 to 90% of your success in anything is that mindset and psychology. And that's what I talk about on my podcast and so on and so forth. But, you know, since then, I've owned 2,000 houses that I've rented long term. I own thousands of apartment units in seven states. And in 2006, my net worth went up $17 million while I slept. And you might say, wow. And I said, wow. And I got a head so big, I could barely fit it through a door. I thought I was a freaking real estate God. And you know, when that happens, God or whatever you believe, it give you a nice little smackdown. Well, that was 2008 and nine. I lost $50 million conservatively in 2008 and nine. And, and so again, what I'm known for talking about is the mindset, you know, in my boot camps and at my, in my live events and virtual events and, and on my podcast is the mindset it took to have 50 million to lose in the first place. But probably more importantly is the mindset it took to recover from that to the success that I'm blessed to have today. You know, I know we're not going to talk about psychology. By the way, if you are listening and you are interested in mindset and psychology, check out my podcast because I do a clip every week called Own Your Power. You give me five minutes a week, I will juice you. I promise because there's hundreds of them there. So my podcast is called Lifetime Cash Flow. And if you go to rodslinks.com, not only is the podcast link there, but there's tons of free resources there about multifamily there as well. So rodslinks.com. But anyway, I think today we're going to talk about economic stuff, yes? Yep, yep. So what's on everybody's mind these days, man? It's yeah, like the economy's yeah. going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> I think we are headed for an economic you-know-what storm. In fact, I just saw a quote yesterday from a guy named Gary Schiller. He's an economist that actually predicted the 08 and 09 crash. And he said, there is a commercial real estate bubble that is about to burst. I think it's already burst, okay? I can tell you, I mean, of course, we all know what's happening with the interest rates, okay? We all know what's happening with inflation. I mean, I can't believe people can afford to buy groceries. I'm recently single and I you know, didn't used to buy groceries and I went to the grocery store and I'm like, you're telling me that's $150? Are you freaking kidding me? And I'm like, how do people afford this? And the clerk just shook her head and gas, I mean, $100 to fill up my truck. Are you kidding? You know, I don't know how people afford it, but that coupled with these high interest rates to try to tame that, which is about the only mechanism they really have other than quantitative tightening, pull money out of the money system, you know, is all they have. And I'm going to tell you, um, here's why I think commercial real estate is really going to have a reckoning. There's several things going on. Number one is office. I mean, the office occupancy in this country is under 80%, okay, occupancy. And so those people that own those assets aren't breaking even. And the debt on those assets is owned by small and regional banks, a lot of it, at least a third of it. I think we're going to see bank failures, guys. I really do. And I hate it, but I think we are. And I've got some headlines here that I, I've quoted in the past. Elon Musk, this is a quote. Everyone's lying. A bigger crash is coming. Okay? Even Trump, love him or hate him, 
It warns U.S. economy could reach levels of the Great Depression. This is Newsweek. I mean, this is these are these are headlines. These are quotes. Uh, he said that during a Save America rally back in the, I think when he was. Well, it's probably more recently than I thought. Um, and so, so here's the thing: we're headed for a recession if we're not already in it. Commercial real estate's in trouble for a lot of reasons. Okay, we have 1.6 trillion. I mean, forget the office situation. I mean, that's bad enough on its own. But we have 1.6 trillion in commercial debt coming due by the end of next year. Now, if somebody has, and and I think a half a trillion by the, by December of this year. Now, here's the thing: those people either have to sell or they have to refinance. Neither one is easy right now. Sales are down 85, 90%. Okay, that's reality. Things are not selling because of these interest rates. So that's number one. So sales are hard. Number two is refinances are extremely hard because in my world, in the commercial real estate world, there's something called a debt service coverage ratio. See, the banks and the lending institutions look at the property's ability to service the debt. They're not, they don't care how much you make. They want to know that the property can handle it. So I'll give you a great kind of example of this. And this is typically an annual calculation. So let's assume that your net income on a property is $125,000 for the year. 125,000 net income. Let's assume your debt is 100,000 annualized, your mortgage payments over the year, 100,000 total. So 125,000 income, 100,000 debt. That's a 1.25% debt service coverage ratio. Now that's pretty much what most banks wanna see. So here's the problem. You've got these operators that have this short-term debt, adjustable rate debt, bridge debt, or even regular debt that's coming due. And most likely they're gonna have to go into bridge debt again which is adjustable rate, they're going to have to buy down the loan far enough where they can get a debt service coverage that the bank will even consider sniffing the deal. That's number one. That could be millions. Then they have to buy what's called a rate cap. And I'm going to tell you, rate caps are incredibly expensive. I've got a quote here. A three-year rate cap for 3% for a $100 million loan costs $23,000 in 2020. So, in 2020, if you wanted to cap your interest rate not to go past 3% above what you, you're signing on, for three years, it cost you 23000 That same rate cap, this is eight months ago, now costs for one year, forget three years, you're not going to get three years, one year costs $2.3 million, okay? These guys have to come up with this money. Okay, and, and that's why you're seeing a lot of capital calls from operators. You're seeing deals go south because these guys put either short-term or adjustable rate debt on these properties. And so we're going to see some incredible opportunities in multifamily. I was mentioning to you guys before we started recording, I've got a deal right now. We're going under contract on Monday. We have an accepted LOI, and it's a, in San Antonio. And I believe it was listed for around $28 million. We're getting it for twenty. Okay, that's a screaming deal. And and it's an assumption. So we're assuming low interest rate debt on it. And so the guy just it, it ran into some trouble. But but the point is, the, a lot of these distressed assets are coming to fruition. So if you're sitting here listening and you want to take advantage of this economic uncertainty, because it could be the greatest transfer of wealth we see in our lifetimes, I'll give you a quote. It's Warren Buffett's quote. I'm holding up a picture of him. And he, he's, he's preparing for a market downturn. This is a quote from him as well. But he has a quote that is, be fearful when others are greedy. There's been a lot of greed these last few years. Be fearful when others are greedy. But be greedy when others are fearful. Okay? And fear is coming, guys. It's already here. There's a lot of fear in, in this environment. And so, you know, you're going to see the news is going to paint it to be even worse. And this is why I spend so much time on mindset and my podcast and at my events, because it's going to be scary. If you come to one of my boot camps, the first thing we do is goal setting because, you know, you got to know what it is you want and you focus on that instead of the news, because it'll be real easy to get sucked into fear. Because like I remember in 2008, for example, the news was saying real estate will be terrible for 10 years. Well, multifamily rents exceeded pre-crash levels in less than three years. That's how fast it bounced back. So if you don't get caught up in the fear and you pick your vehicle to take advantage of what's coming, this could be your greatest opportunity of your lifetime, the opportunity to build cash flow for yourself, your kids, their kids, their kids, and their kids. That's what's coming, okay? But you got to get up to speed as fast as you can. You got to pick your vehicle. I think there's going to be opportunities in all sorts of things, buying businesses, buying retail, buying off. I wouldn't buy office. I almost said office. No, stay away from office. I, buying retail, buy self-storage, buy, you know, mobile home parks, office industrial, you know, office warehouse stuff, and certainly multifamily. But you got to get up to speed 
quick, okay? Because if you if we're in the thick of it and it's coming, it's going to be too late to because you got to build relationships, you've got to understand how to evaluate deals and so on and so forth. Do you mind if I plug my boot camp for a second? I mean, we're we're okay. We've got a virtual boot camp coming up. It's coming up on January sixth and seventh. It's virtual. It's two days. I don't sell anything there, and I'll give you a code to come for ninety seven dollars. Okay, so if you're interested in multifamily, there's no excuses because you can come learn the business for a whopping ninety seven bucks and. Um, you use tax smart as a code, okay? And use tax smart as the code, and you can come for $97. You go to rodslinks.com, same place I sent you before, rodslinks.com to sign up for my podcast. You should absolutely listen to my podcast. Again, that's going to help you get up to speed faster as well, just like you know the, the, this show will. But you got to get up to speed as fast as you can. Go to rodslinks.com, go to the bootcamp site, and use tax smart as the code, you can come for 97 bucks. And I promise you'll be glad you came. If you don't love it, I don't mean like it. If you come and you don't love it, I'll give you your 97 bucks back. It's never happened, but there's a first time for everything. But anyway, so so that's what I think is happening, at least in the commercial space. Obviously, single family is also slowed down. And there's a huge bottleneck there. Now, all of this said, this crash, the real crash could be delayed another year because I really believe... So I think you're going to see interest rates come down. You'll see a flood of houses come on the market where people try to sell and buy something else. They're not selling now because they're going to pay a fortune in interest on their new place. So you've got a lot of backlog. There's a huge demand for housing, but that's not going to prevent what's going to happen in the commercial space. So again, I, I do think things are going to look good early to to the November of next year. Things will look better. Interest rates will come down. We'll see more, you know, we'll see deals. But after that, all bets are off, guys. I think, again, the proverbial, you know what's going to hit the fan. I really do. I mean, here's a headline. Expect layoffs at 51% of U.S. companies. You know, about six months ago, I saw a headline that said 20 million U.S. households are behind in their utility bills. Okay. 20 million households. I mean, so again, it's kind of ugly. A lot of people are using credit cards to pay their everyday expenses. What's wrong with that picture, right? So I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to get you excited because opportunity is coming. So don't get scared by this. Think, how am I going to capitalize on this? Pick a vehicle, learn it, and, and go kick butt because it could be incredible for you and your family. Absolutely. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now. And multifamily might be the vehicle for some people out there. If it is, you got to go attend Rod's boot camp. Make sure you learn that asset class. So say someone learns the asset class of multifamily, right? Um, they they kind of wrap their head around the strategies. What can they do to best position themselves to take advantage of this upcoming? Um, oh, I, you know, you have to create a brand. You have to get around people that are doing it because on the first couple of deals, you'll typically utilize what's called a sponsor. Okay, and that's somebody that's got a resume with a few hundred or a few thousand doors. They've got a net worth and liquidity to help you get the deal done, and they can hold your hand while you do the deal. This is, and I'll I'll brag for a minute. I've got coaching students. They're my warriors. They're they're called my warriors. They're my mentorship students. I don't know, I've over a thousand around the country. They now own, I believe, around a hundred and eighty thousand units. And I've only been teaching five years. I'm super proud of that. And most of those deals were done between warriors because there's dozens of sponsorships groups in there. So if you got to go to your local meetup groups. You got to find people that are doing this and align with them and utilize them as a mentor and or a sponsor to take down your first deal. So that when you approach a broker or a seller, you can say, we own a thousand units or 300 units or whatever it is. Use the we word to build credibility. Okay. And that's how everybody gets started in this business. And then once you've taken down one or two deals and you've got your own resume and you don't need a sponsor any longer, but that's how you get started. And, and yes, you're not going to get the whole deal, big deal. Even if you only get a percentage of it, who cares? It's, it's going on your resume and you're off to the races, but that's how it works. Okay. And that's how you get started, but it starts with the education. You know, and anything that you want to do, even buying businesses. Like I'd love to buy some businesses. I think there's going to be incredible opportunity in all sorts of things. I think everything's going on sale. And so, you know, just position yourself to be able to capitalize on something that interests you, whatever it is. So, yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So we're going to drop the, the boot camp into the show notes for everybody. Quick question. For, what about the people who are maybe already in this situation? Maybe they have debt. They're in trouble. Do. 
Uh, maybe they have to sell. Like, wh- I mean, what can they do to save themselves, I guess? Yeah, I will tell you, I've agonized this about this a lot because I worry about my warriors. They bought a ton of properties and some of them use bridge debt. And luckily, I only have one deal right now that I know of that's going south. And it is going south. I hate to say it. The property management company they had massively screwed these people around. And, you know, they're going to litigate, but nobody wins when they litigate. But the bottom line is, you know, I actually went to a conference to uh, IMN Mid-Market Conference in Atlanta, I don't know, about six months ago to see if there was any rescue capital there. I got about six business cards from people that provide rescue capital to go in. Now, the problem is you typically lose your interest. I mean, that's like the 11th hour last thing you do if you've got a deal that's going south. But, you know, a lot of operators are doing what's called capital calls, okay, where they reach out to their current investors and say, hey, we need you put in a little more money to save this deal and protect your investment. Now, I can tell you investors are getting tired of it already. You know, that's that's something people do. I will tell you, um, the Fed has instructed lenders that if a borrower is credit worthy, they should try to work with them. And that means possible forbearance. You don't make payments for six months or whatever, or or a loan modification of some sort. So, But they have to consider you credit worthy as in quotation marks. So I don't know what that's going to look like. So hopefully some of that will happen. But there's no question there's going to be a lot of distressed assets. I've created a fund to actually take advantage of these distressed assets. And if you're an accredited investor, I'd love to hear from you. Text the word partner to 72345. Again, that's partner to 72345. Or I've got an incredible resource for you, actually. We created this, this what we call a cash flow club. And it's got all sorts of videos, free books, articles, emails that I've sent our investors. It's an incredible resource. And we do webinars every month there. It's called the Cree Cash Flow Club, C-R-E-E cashflowclub.com. And I forgot what the text is for it. I think it's club. It's just club to 72345. I'm fairly certain if you text club, we'll send you that domain. That's an incredible resource if you're an accredited investor and you want to learn you know, invest intelligently. Okay. You know, why would you give your hard earned money to someone unless you got some basic understanding of what it is? So the name of the game right now is education. It really is. And then you've got to take massive action and not get caught up in the fear because it's going to be pervasive, the fear for sure. Do you think maybe even the government would kind of swoop in and try to save some of those investors as well? You kind of talked about like it, private loans and, they could, and stuff. Th- they could throw another couple trillion at this thing, but what does that hurt? Right? We're already paying a ton of money at the grocery store and the pumps. That's just going to exasperate that problem again. So right. yes, they could, and they may. I think the piper has got to get paid at some point. And I'll tell you, you want to hear something else that's really sobering. Because the interest rates are so high right now, our national debt interest on our debt exceeds what we take in a year from the IRS. The interest payments exceeds what we take in from the IRS. I had an expert here on my show. We did an in-person interview about that. I mean, that's some scary stuff, guys. At some point, something's got to give. You know, it's like all these holes in the dike, and I'm a Dutch guy, so I'll use a dike metaphor. So you got all the fingers in the dikes. At some point, the dike's going to just explode, okay? And so who knows, you know, if they kick the can down the curb a little further. But on the commercial debt side, unless they throw trillions at it, we're going to see some real carnage for sure. Hey, real quick, if you're a longtime listener of the show, then you know we give all of our tax secrets away for free, from how to use the real estate professional status and short-term rental loophole to save thousands of dollars in taxes, and just about everything in between, we don't hold anything back. And that's because our goal is to help as many real estate investors as possible reduce taxes and build tax advantage wealth, regardless of budget. And the only way we're able to help more real estate investors is if you can rate, review, and share the podcast. If you could take that one small action, just drop us a review. It'll take like 10 seconds. It will help more real estate investors become tax smart. We appreciate your support. And now back to the show. Yeah. And specifically office, we've kind of been highlighting that. Do you foresee more and more people maybe converting those to like multifamily apartments? It's a People are trying to do that. Um, I just saw three of those attempts go south in foreclosure in Dallas. And I'm going to tell you, it's it's difficult. It's very difficult because you have to replumb everything. You have to make sure it's codes for safety and fire and the electrical has to be upgraded. It's much easier to take like one of these extended stay hotels that's got a small kitchen and turn that into a, a multifamily. But office is not easy at all. Like big open spaces, right? Now all of a sudden, like if you think and about- that, Here's the other problem. Here's the other problem. With the office building, you've got the, you'll have enclosed bedrooms, which you can't have. Bedrooms have to have two points of egress. Okay, so that's another issue in office buildings. You've got all those interior offices that have no windows. You can't have that. So what do you do with that space? So that's another big issue with conversion. 
Um, and there's some people doing it, trying to do it. Now, could there be some other uses for those office buildings? Sure. Maybe a data center, maybe interior farming where you open it all up and you put the grow lights in and all that stuff. You throw tilapia in or whatever you do that or, or self-storage, you turn it into self-storage. So there's a lot of things being considered, but there's so much of it. A lot of people aren't renewing. You know, they have leases coming due in these big companies. People don't want to go back to work in an office. They've got a taste of Zoom and everything else. Like we're using Zoom. You know, it's, it's I don't want to go to a freaking office. I'm doing this from my, I have a compound. I'm blessed to have six buildings here. So I'm a little blessed, but you know, most people do this stuff from home now. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's what we do. That's, that's what we do. We right. 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 And thank you. Thank you. Right. Exactly. And, and nobody wants to work in an office anymore. And so, you know, COVID created a bit of a, a problem there, right? And that's just office. Again, we still have tons of debt coming through on other asset classes. So there may be a reprieve for a while before the election, but I really don't believe after the election there will be. I think they're going to let the stuff hit the fan. I think they have to. There has to be some sort of a correction here because it's 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 like this giant bubble and it just keeps getting bigger. I mean, like I just talked about the national debt. Good God. And I think I just saw like a headline uh, a day or two ago, like, Single family houses are still increasing in value. They're up because of the demand, because of the demand. And they can bounce up even more when the rates come down and, and then there's a huge uh, surge. But if you're going to invest uh, here, I would argue with you not to do single family. I really would. You know, I get people like, hey, I can get $300 a month cash flow. This is awesome on a house. Well, here's what they don't realize. Okay. Again, I've owned 2,000 houses I've rented long term. So I can speak credibly about this. If a house goes empty, let's say you're getting that $300 a month, it's going to cost you five grand to get that thing ready to re-rent again in many cases, three to five minimum, okay? You're going to lose a couple months rent, maybe three months rent, getting it ready and getting it re-rented. You've just lost the cash flow for two years, okay? Or a year at least. But if you've got a fourplex even and one unit's empty, you might still be breaking even. I've got a 296 unit in San Antonio. I've got 25 empties. No big deal. We're over 90% occupied. Who cares, right? So- that's why if you're going to buy and hold, for God's sakes, do multifamily, don't do single family. It's the reason I started my podcast, because it was my single family in 08 and 09 that caused me to crash and burn. It wasn't my multifamily. And I get hate on this all the time. Yeah, you were over leveraged. No, I owed 30 cents on the dollar. I was at a 30% loan to value on my portfolio and I still crashed and burned. In fact, let me explain why, because people always ask and they're wondering, how could you possibly have lost it? Well, here's the thing. Part of my thing was I was logistically challenged because I had houses two hours north of me, two hours south of me, and everywhere in between. So that was a big piece, and I'll explain why that's a big piece in a minute. But taxes here in Florida, property taxes are higher because there's no state income tax. That's why you can't keep people from coming here right now. They're flooding in here. Okay, that's one thing. But I had properties also in wind and flood zones, higher insurance, impacts cash flow. But what killed me was the logistics. So if I sent somebody uh, and the maintenance, these properties were C-class houses. You know, there's A, B, C, and D. A is brand new. D is the hood. Stay out of the hood. Ask me how I know. But these were C, okay? And so, you know, tougher demographic, older homes, lots more maintenance. So if I sent a maintenance guy, and I had several apartment complexes in 08 as well. If I sent a maintenance guy to one of my apartment complexes, everything stockpiled. Plumbing parts, electrical parts, HVAC parts, appliance parts, they're in and out in an hour. Fix it. But if they had to go to a house that's an hour away, they got to go see what's wrong. Or even if it was just down the road, they got to go see what's wrong. They got to go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's where you have an account. And I don't know about you guys, but when Rod tries to fix something, he ends up going to Home Depot more than once. Okay. And, and same thing with these maintenance guys. And what took an hour at one of my apartment complexes, because we stocked pop parts, took all day at these 800 houses. And so they never really cash flowed. But then the coup de grace, as it were, was I didn't pay attention to tenant demographics back then. If they had good credit and they paid a deposit, I let them rent. But I discovered after the fact, when I look back on it, I had a ton of contractors in my houses, plumbers, electricians, drywallers, painters, roofers, and that just fell off a freaking cliff. They didn't have any work, so they couldn't pay the rent. And so it just imploded. And you want to hear something crazy. By the end of 2009, my portfolio was actually upside down. It dropped more than 70% here in value. That's how staggering the drop was. So I got crushed by that wave. I'm surfing this one, guys, okay? I'm in a lot of cash. I have access to a lot of cash, and I'm excited about the opportunities that are coming. Yeah, it's going to suck for a lot of people, but you know what? I went through it. I lost $50 million. By God, yeah, you, you know, some of these guys are going to lose something. They'll, they'll recover. They'll get back up, but there'll be some incredible opportunity. 
for sure. And I appreciate you coming on and you're sharing all of this information with us. Cause I know there's a lot of people out there who really don't know what's going on. And they're like, you know, what do I do? Do I buy? Do I, do I sit tight? Like it, let me, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. You just said something really important. Cause I get asked that all the time. Should I wait to buy? The deals are already coming. See, the thing of it is you've got to be evaluating lots of deals right now to learn the business. So don't wait. Get going, get up to speed as fast as you can because the deals were already coming. Um, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to throw that in before I forgot. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely no problem. And uh, you know, I was just saying, because a lot of people just don't really know what's going on with it. Should it sit tight? Even limited partners, right? Limited partners, people invest passively. You know, they're scrutinizing deals, you know, extra heavily right now uh, yeah. because they're very concerned about, you know, if they jump into a deal, you know, what's going to happen. So it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's a crazy well, they, time. They need, they need to go to that text club to 72345, go to that cash flow club, watch our webinar series because we talk about the impact of debt on a deal. Debt is a huge component of a deal. We talk about, you know, lots of different things in our webinar series. There's tons of free resources. So definitely go there if you are a passive uh, investor or you want to be and check out that information because it's incredibly valuable. I don't think there's anything like it out there that's, that has this many, that this much information for passive investors. No, absolutely. We're going to drop all that into the show notes. You know, we covered a lot today. Before we wrap up, is there any parting words, anything you think listeners should know that we have not covered yet today? No, just, just to not be fearful. And by God, don't be in the same place you are now, two or three years from now, when you have an opportunity to capitalize on what's coming. Decide where how you're going to do that and learn it. Learn whatever aspect of entrepreneurship you're going to learn as a side hustle to capitalize on this and build a, an incredible financial future because I really believe there's going to be incredible opportunity. I, I in my heart, I, I'm certain of it. So, you know, even if it's a mild, there's 80 million baby boomers retiring that own businesses. You can get into that and look at buying businesses. Say, and it's the same thing in real estate. Most people that have kids aren't interested in real estate. My kids aren't. They come help me at events, but they haven't done anything with it, which is crazy to me. We won't get, go down that path. But anyway, so it's, you know, these, these people, they want to sell something or they, they want out of a, a deal. You know, you get a lot of retirees that own real estate and they're phenomenal deals. You can get, you know, owner financing on if you, if you know how to do it. And that's, I teach all that at my boot camp. So. All right. All right. So if, if you guys want to check that out, it's going to be in the show notes. Uh, Rod, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Like last Oh, thanks brother. About- mindset we'll go ahead and we'll, we're gonna i'll find which episode that was and i'll drop that in the show notes too for everybody who wants to check that out yeah thanks guys great to see you again man ha, ha, by the way happy holidays happy holidays to you you too thanks rod all right so we're back for part two we're gonna be debriefing we're gonna be testing out a debrief i know brandon and i used to do this on the show but now with ryan coming back on the show we're gonna test that out and you know Something really interesting about this episode is we didn't really focus too much on tax, but you know, with 2024 right around the corner, I know a lot of listeners are interested to see, you know, what what different investors think about what's currently going on in the marketplace and how that might impact their plans, their goals for the 2024 year, um, as well as perhaps, you know, how to navigate the waters, even if you're not going to jump into the game as an active investor, maybe you're thinking about being an LP. Should you be making investments right now? Should you be waiting? These are things that's on people's minds right now. And uh, glad that Rod was able to come on and address some of that stuff. Yeah, I think one key thing that he mentioned was education. As he was talking about opportunities for people, there definitely is. And if you're already in the game, let's say you're a, a GP already, like him, he's already looking for things. And like he said, like there's already deals out there. It's not something that you necessarily need to wait for like this like huge correction or recession, depression, whatever you want to call it. Who knows how extensive and big this is going to be. And I think even within the real estate industry as a whole market, there's right subcategories to the market, right? Office, we hit on multifamily, we hit on single family, we hit on. And like you even mentioned, Tom, it's like, yeah, interest rates are up for all real estate, because we all pretty much use debt, right? Not everyone, but most people do. And so it's like interest rates are up for all. But then you look at each asset class within real estate. And like you said, single family is still like moving up, or it's like just staying steady, depending on the market. But then he talked about all the commercial, especially office, where it's like these values are not going down and significantly. So even within real estate, if you think big picture, you've got to look at even the subcategories of real estate 
to determine like, what am I going to focus in? Or do you stick with the current thing that you're already doing? Or do you go into another asset and you're already starting to transition there, but making sure that you're getting the education that you need to feel comfortable doing that and then continuing to move forward and looking out for the deals and practicing like running those deals. That was another thing that he mentioned, which I think is is really key. Just kind of practicing the due diligence and running the numbers to make sure it makes sense. No, 100%. And I'm, I'm a big believer there's always opportunity thanks to human error. Like there's always opportunity. You heard Rod, Rod said they're assuming debt, right? They're assuming debt on this property, low interest debt, but the guy got whoever they're buying the deal from got into struggles. So it wasn't like the debt necessarily in this particular deal is what caused them to sell at $8 million below what they listed it for, but it was the actual human error. So there's always those opportunities. And if you're in the game, see, if you're not in the game, you can't capitalize on that. Rod's been in the game. So when he sees an opportunity like that, he's prepared to capitalize on it. And you saw that he's doing that. The interesting thing, if if he's right, I do think there's some truth to what he's saying, you know, about this it really not hitting the fan until later next year. Um, then you have an entire year to prepare. You have an entire year to really kind of get your ducks in a row, get your education, get your teams right, start networking, you know, get your your partners. Most people don't take down these deals, these multifamily properties as a single owner. I mean, I did a syndication back in 2017. We talked about it here on the show before, and it was done with a group of people. And not one person in that group could have individually took that deal down themselves. Not one person. Someone needed to have the financing uh, to be able to sign the loan, the balance sheet to sign the loan. Uh, someone else need to have the connection. Someone else need to have, be able to raise the capital. And someone, you know, you know what I mean? Like it's a team sport when it comes to this game. And now it, it is. And now you have an entire year to build your team. You have an entire year to build your team to be able to capitalize on it. And the sooner you get in the game, the better. I laugh because that's literally what I was going to say. I was going to say, this is a team sport. So it was just funny. I was like ready to say it as on the tip of my tongue. And then you said it. So absolutely. And as I think about like a team sport, like you could say that for business, you could say that for real estate investing. Like if you see your real estate investing, especially as a syndicator, you're working with so many people. You've got the LPs, right? That's part of the deal. You've got the debt with the bank, right? You've got your property manager. You've got your handyman team, right? Doing all the repairs. You've got so many people in the mix of this. This is absolutely a team sport, especially the bigger you get. I think the more people, obviously, you're going to need just for the sake of capacity, energy, time, all that stuff. So absolutely, I agree with you. This is something that you should, you can be preparing for, as you said, and Rod said, like, be preparing for it now. And you can't go back, right? So even if you're like, ah, yeah. oh, shoot, you know, I didn't have the foresight to be preparing for this a few months ago. That's fine. Start preparing today uh, if you're planning to do this and and move forward. That's all you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, for everybody listening out there, I know we didn't cover too much tax in this episode, but sometimes you need to know what's going on in the marketplace is one great way to, to learn how to do that. We have a few people coming up on the show, a few interesting guests. We have Taylor Brugna, who's going to be joining us talk about the importance of accounting. And right now around year end, when we're kind of getting to the tail end of the year, is the best time to get your accounting in place if you haven't already. Uh, so it's gonna be super, super important episode. That's I think coming up next week. And then the following week, we're gonna have James Sebatek coming on. He's short-term rental expert. Curious to see how he's playing the game in the short-term rental market, given what's going on. I know it's we've had uh, Jamie Jamie Lane on from Air DNA a few months ago, and he was talking about how it's a little saturated in the short term rental market starting to normalize. So interested to see how James and his investors are are operating in this space during this time. But yeah, so guys, if you like this episode, uh, go ahead and leave us a, a review, uh, rate, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff helps us get the show out to more people, help them become tax smart, help them stay in touch with what's going on in the marketplace. And yeah, I think we're going to close. We're going to wrap. Any final words before we before we go, Ryan? No, all good. Thanks.